So Molly, I've been thinking about this. I'm online all the time, except when I'm sleeping. <laughs> Do you think having the internet at home has become a necessity? Or is it still, I don't know, like a, a luxury item? <laughs> of course it's a necessity, Jim. I mean... I could not do my job if I didn't have the internet at home. My students are emailing me constantly. <laughs> I mean, they couldn't do their job as students without having the internet at home. They do all their assignments online. So, yeah, it, it is essential. All right, interesting. So, USA Today disagrees with you. They just did <laughs> this big article with an infographic that was about non-essential uh, spending, right? One of those, like, cut costs articles. Uh -huh. And it had, like, uh, going out for dinner and personal grooming. And then it had cable on it. What? Yeah, and people went ballistic on social media. Cable is how most Americans get their internet access today. What did they think? Like, <laughs> right. people just use it to stream Game of Thrones? It's like how you stay connected to the world today. Well, well right, and, and we're always talking on the show about urban technologies, but if folks don't have access to the internet, then really everything we're talking about about urban tech just goes totally out the window. Exactly, and it's crazy to think that millions of Americans still don't have access to the internet at home right now, which creates a huge digital equity issue. Yeah, and it's frustrating, too, because it's something we've been trying to solve for, I don't know, 20 years. Mm -hmm. So today, you know, we're going to get into this issue of broadband access in the U.S., why access is so far from universal, and how cities are innovating to address the issue. We're going to talk with someone who can explain the history of how we got here and what a lack of access means for people's lives. Maya Wiley co-chairs the Digital Equity Laboratory at the New School in New York, and you may have seen her on MSNBC, where she is a frequent contributor. I have indeed, and I can't wait to talk to her. We'll be back with that conversation right after the break. Welcome to Technopolis, where technology is disrupting, remaking, and sometimes overrunning our cities. I'm Molly Turner. I teach urban innovation at the Berkeley Haas School of Business, and I was the first policy director at Airbnb. And I'm Jim Capsis. I was a climate negotiator in the Obama administration, and now I advise tech startups. Today we're talking with Maya Wiley. She's a scholar and advocate for social justice and a leading voice on digital equity. And when she was general counsel for New York Mayor Bill de Blasio, she was partly responsible for coming up with this idea to turn all of New York's public phone booths into free Wi-Fi hotspots. I remember that. When they rolled out, didn't they have a little bit of a hiccup because people were just streaming porn on the sidewalk? Yeah, they got some not-so-great headlines out of the gate, but they fixed it. <laughs> and yeah. it turns out they've actually had 6 million people use that free service, at least according to the wow. New York City's website. Yeah. You know, and there are also other, you know, examples of cities doing innovative things like Chattanooga, Tennessee. They've got their own publicly delivered broadband service. You've got Kansas City partnered with Google Fiber to deliver uh, high speed service. But all things considered, those are pretty small scale experiments. I mean, most U.S. cities are still stuck with the usual suspects, right? The Comcast, the Verizons, uh -huh, the yep. AT&Ts which still don't serve every community. No, they don't. Well, I guess the question is, how bad is the internet status quo in our country? And what does it mean for those of us who have access and for the millions who don't have access at all? And how do we get here? That's what we wanted to talk to Maya about. Twenty million Americans don't have access to broadband today, according to the Federal Communications Commission. And I've heard you say that 25% of New Yorkers don't have access at home to broadband. How do we get there? And why should cities care? Well, I want to backtrack one step and say that the FCC doesn't know how many people have <laughs> broadband. Jeez, why not? Well, they have <laughs> estimates, Got right? It. And right. actually, that's all any of us have, because the providers have the data and they're very quiet with their data. Comcast, AT&T, exactly. Verizon. The point is not that we haven't made progress. It's that we don't really know how deep or broad the problem is for the average person in this country who needs to be able to not just get online, but be able to do what the technology promises. For example... Going to school and getting just the adequate level of information and participation in school requires you to be able to get online at home, right. not just your smartphone. And I think that's the other thing we get confused about right now is yeah, that— Yeah, help us understand that, the difference. Well, because we used to talk about a digital divide, in, mm -hmm. and, and in the 90s, what a digital divide meant was 
If you were black or Latino, you probably didn't have a computer at home. Mm-hmm. Right. But mobile technology has really narrowed the equipment divide in, in a significant way, mm-hmm. meaning lots of people have smartphones now. Even if they're low income, we have much, much, much higher rates of usage of both cell phones and smartphones in particular, on one level, it is seen as the great equalizer. Yeah, a lot of people uh, are like, it's solved. It's solved. And and actually, it looks that way globally, too, right? Mm-hmm. The problem is, one, people don't can't pay for unlimited data if they're low income. You're rationing your usage. You're rationing your usage. But the other thing is, try doing your homework on a smartphone. All right, try, on a smartphone. Just try oh, doing it. Right. I, I don't even write emails on my smartphone anymore. It's too much of a pain. Same with a Applying for a job, right. you know, yeah. so even if you want to be a gas station attendant, you have to apply online now. Do different communities have faster and slower internet? Like, does like is there still a kind of divide between how you're getting the internet? Absolutely. So we actually did some of this research in Detroit. Detroit is a real gap, 40 percent, I think it's I read, of crazy. without any home internet. Without any ho- – it's amongst the lowest in the country. And it's a city, right? Yeah. There's no question that rural areas have huge issues in terms of access. This is a city. And that's also historic because it's about how we developed the technology using – telephone service as the sort of cabling, so to speak, of and the backbone for what became broadband. But historically, even back in the 90s when we were creating this quote-unquote information superhighway, a lot of the telephone companies were skipping over low-income communities of color in terms of upgrading their infrastructure and only upgrading it initially and for long periods of time where you had white communities. And is that because they're upgrading it in places where they know those households are able to afford to pay higher rates for greater service? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly what they said. I mean, we had one business executive, I think it was U.S. West, who was very explicit about it. He said, look, it's silly to say we won't serve these communities. We just won't serve them first because it costs us a lot of money. And so we're going to go to where we think we'll get subscribers. And because we did it differently in the U.S. from, say, many European countries or, or, or Asia, what we're seeing is that we have less competition and therefore higher prices for slower service. Sounds like a great Wait, mix. So it's a great, mix. a great combination. It's a great combination. Right. So what happens is communities of color get skipped almost altogether for initial capital mm-hmm. expenses and upgrades. And uh, But white communities aren't getting served well. They're just getting served better than the communities of color. But at an international level, we drop down from fifth on the industrialized country chart. Yeah. In, what, like 2000? By 2007, we were 22nd. What are they doing better in these other countries? They they don't have these monopolies or oligopolies that we have? Like, what's, why do they have better service? They're protecting competition. Mm. <laughs> We've confused regulation as if regulation is somehow what chokes competition. But we used to have pro-competition policies that, that were fairly bipartisan, by the way. This, this wasn't a big disagreement between Democrats and Republicans back in the 80s and 90s. Many of them were saying, OK, you big telephone companies, you have to enable these Internet service providers to use your conduit at wholesale. You can't gouge them right. so that they're able to compete with you. Right. And if they don't do a better product and they don't get better service, you're still going to win, right? But if they can, you know, and create real competition for you, then you got to figure out how to do it better. But that didn't happen. But that, well, we, t- we took it. We deregulated we it, it. That's got what it. we deregulated. It's senior. like a precursor to mm-hmm. net neutrality, by the way. Well, it is. It's a complete precursor. It's exactly what laid the groundwork for the net neutrality fight because mm. under the Bush administration, it said, we're going to ignore the fact that cable is now a two-way communication system. Explain, though, how deregulation led to less competition When you have small entrepreneurial providers who are not going to create the underlying pipes, right? They're just going to use to create more services for consumers. What they initially had was protection in terms of the prices they were going to be charged. Mm. So what the telecoms did is when the FCC said, you know what? We're not going to protect the little guy new entrants anymore into the market. We're going to actually tell the proprietaries, we're going to deregulate by saying, yeah, charge them whatever you want. 
So what you're saying to the big guys, who, by the way, got a lot of subsidy themselves to become big. Right. Subsidies we, to actually install the pipes and the correct. wires, which is the right. backbone of the entire system Exactly. So our public dollars help them become the monopolies they are. Right. Mm-hmm. So we call that deregulation rather got than it. calling it monopolistic protection, mm. which is really what we should have called it. But that is the precursor to the net neutrality fight. And is it information? Is it an information service or is it more like a utility? So what I'm hearing you say, Maya, is this lack of competition has led us to be really behind in the United States, which is ironic because we pride ourselves on being the country that's the best at <laughs> at creating uh, competitive markets. But so it's led us to this situation where we have – I guess you don't call it the digital divide anymore. It's We have a digital equity problem in this country, right? What you, we used to call a digital divide is, is now not just about equipment and having the signal, right. although that's clearly right. still critically it's important. The baseline. Yeah. That's still the baseline. But it's much more than that now that we're seeing deep machine learning, now that we have progressed to the point – in the information economy, which is which is what the internet was all right. was always building, that that economy is driven by data, and that data is created based on whether or not you're online. Mm-hmm. If the artificial intelligence and deep machine learning is going to drive a social good, for whom, whose data is it built on? When right. we see it discriminating, it's because, in some instances, we either we have too much data about you know, discriminated populations, like in Mm -hmm. policing, Mm -hmm. or we don't have enough. credit. And then the data itself has problems because we are not an equitable society in terms of what data exists on whom and Mm -hmm. how. So Mm -hmm. all of those problems are our next generation problems that are created by the digital divide of the 90s that we never really solved. We'll be back with more from Maya Wiley right after this quick break, so stay with us. All right, so let's talk solutions, things that are happening now around the country that signal maybe ways things could be done differently. I've read you were involved in this sort of Link NYC effort. Yeah. I'm not sure if everyone's been to New York recently and seen these kiosks, but they're these screens that have advertisements for whatever, for right. movies or TV shows or products. That's right. Tell us the story about Link NYC and how is that set up differently to provide Wi-Fi yeah. access to more people? Well, I want to tell two stories. Okay. So when I went to work for Mayor de Blasio as his counsel, and he said, you're going to help me figure out how to get universal broadband to residents. And I thought, Oh, shit. <laughs> I said we need it. I didn't say I knew how to get it. Right, right. <laughs> um, and two things happened. One, it started with Bloomberg, and I want to give the Bloomberg administration credit here. They understood that we had to rethink pay phones. Right. This they, asset that's stranded, doing that's nothing. Right. But worse than nothing. Of, right, worse than nothing. Falling into disrepair. Right. Because but what people amazing have cell infrastructure phones. to have distributed throughout the entire city. Exactly. So they create a competition for creative ideas about what to do about the kiosks. And when the de Blasio administration comes in, it says, great idea, but let's not just think about it as making payphones modern and making them wireless hotspots. Let's think about how that actually delivers more to low-income people Mm -hmm. in the city. So the consortium, they came up with the winning proposal— it was significantly more revenue to the city, guaranteed. It's $500 million over right. a 12-year period. Right. right. And if they made more money than the minimum, they, it was a 50% share in revenue. Also, we could negotiate the rollout of the kiosks to ensure that underserved, low-income residential communities would get super fast speeds right. for free. Even though it was not in-home service, you know, one of the things that Link NYC reported is they have a social services delivery bulletin, so you can go up to the kiosk, you can go online on the tablet on the kiosk for social services. And they have 9,000 searches a month for things like work, for things like public benefits, mm. for SNAP applications. So what it's showing us is exactly what we expected, which is people who just to get some of the services and benefits government offers, 
They need access can't do to the it without, without using can't those do it. kiosks. They, they can't do it at home. And right. now that they have an option, another option, they're using it. Right. I did really think the number one phone call that's made on that system is for SNAP benefits. And EBT, yep. Right. Yep. Right. So it's not just about us all watching our Game of Thrones on streaming <laughs> internet. It's about or pornography. So, so or por- was, yeah, well, let's... A, a brief hiccup as well, <laughs> right? A, that the, was, in, you know... Going away, see. When, right. you, when you innovate, the good right. comes with the bad. When you experiment, you know, a lot of things happen. Yes. But the reason I wanted to say it's two stories is because part of it was then, with the additional revenue, I could argue to give free home-based broadband to Queensbridge Houses, which is the largest public housing development in North America, mm. in home for free. So that has happened, or is that the, that has the happened. plan? That has happened. With the revenue generated with the, with so, for the initial deal. Exactly. A public-private partnership that delivered more revenue to the city in addition to bringing down costs and creating more access for everyone, but in particular for low-income residents. This consortium is generating all this revenue for the city, presumably by ads on the kiosks, right? The business model basically was a free service in exchange for eyeballs. There are these screens that have advertisements for for right. movies or TV shows or products. That's right. right. But it's complicated because, you know, obviously there are people who are very concerned about the data and ads as a driver of revenue. I, I agree that the policy framework we have created in this country for expanding access is essentially a private model, which means when you're a city government, you know, you're doing your best to use the legal levers available to you for the business models that are going to serve more of your low-income people. But it's not because we've solved these issues of data, data privacy, data equity. I mean, right. we have huge, massive policy issues we have to resolve on those. Let fronts. me ask you about data privacy because I know, I mean, the New York Civil Liberties Union has attacked the project for right people's data being taken, harvested, monetized by the company. How do you respond to those criticism is it is the business model is it innovative enough is it go far enough to address so, some of these issues here's what i would distinguish we have a long tradition in this country of the private sector being able to keep very secret what data they're collecting how they're mm-hmm. collecting it and what they're doing with it and if we don't come to grips with that and figure out a way to demand much more because i think what the acl is absolutely right about is we do have to know and understand whether data is being collected, if so, what it's being used for, and have some transparent way for government and or not-for-profit sector to be able to check and make sure that's actually what's happening. I mean, as we've seen from Facebook, you get a lot of, oh, yeah, no, we're... We, we got here, it. Don't worry. We got right. it. We got your privacy. Don't worry. Right. And then you oh, find oops. out... No, we don't. Oh, no, we're giving it away to all kinds of people without any protections for the consumers. Right. <laughs> so that drives distrust that I think is legitimate distrust, That requires something that we haven't built into our policy framework as a country. And cities are often left trying to do their best to get as much service as they can with a lot of limits in federal law to what they can do. And preemption. Preemption and doing their best. I will argue always for this kind of Link NYC model being significantly better than some of the other alternatives. What about, like, municipalization? I mean, we're seeing, at least yes. with utilities, right? Like, in San Francisco right now, we're having this big debate. PG&E has gone bankrupt, and we're having this big debate. Should the city of San Francisco just take over the electric utility? Is that not a viable alternative? There are lots of places that have been creating municipal broadband, and I'm all in favor. Not all cities have utilities. Right, right. I mean, it's happening. Chattanooga's got— Chattanooga yeah. had, it's, got had it. an electric utility. Right. The thing I want us to pay attention to is we often think if it's municipal, it solves all our problems. Right. And it does not. I mean, Chattanooga, Mm. it's amazing that they got the price point down to $26 a month. That's fantastic. That's significantly lower than the average family will pay for broadband at home anywhere. The problem is you still have a large number of people who cannot afford $26. It's still pretty good. No, exactly. It's, it's progress. It, it's big progress. It's a good thing to do. What we always have to pay attention to, even if it's a public model, is the people who are still left out. Right. And, and we will always have to solve the equity issues for people who are low income. So I think part 
part of what we're called to do is think about multiple kinds Mm -hmm. of public models that also are alongside private models, and we shouldn't confuse public with affordable. Speaking of multiple solutions, I want to talk about assuming there are lots of different kind of public-private partnership models out there that we could deploy What should we be building? I mean, we've talked to a bunch of people who've told us, you know, broadband is, you know, a cable that hooks up to your home, whereas, you know, more people can get access to wireless, say, from like one of these Link NYC kiosks. Is there one form of internet connectivity that you would invest in right now over another? Do we need them all? What is going to be the best for creating more digital equity? You know, part of what's happening here is there are multiple forms of technology, and I I think the point is— We really need some redundancies. Hmm. Um, We often are thinking about technology as a one or the other rather than thinking about the truth is there's no wireless without a fiber backbone, number one. So (laughs) we call it wireless as if there's no fiber backbone, but but there is. This is an important point that you have to have – the, the backhaulers, right? That's so right. The broadband for the spine. all... The spine. spine. I just call it the spine. The you spine. Know, you can't have a nervous system without the spine. Right. And in a wireless system, you still need the we spine. Still need so it's the a fa- spine. there is no choice, really. Like, we need broadband because broadband enables That's wireless. That's exactly right. And so Whether that's can, 5G or anything that's else. That's exactly right. So, and the point about it is, what problems are you solving? Right. We have to solve the climate change problem. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Agree, one, agree we're not going to solve that species. with the internet. That's for sure. We're not going to, no, we're not going to solve it with the internet, but this goes back to my, if we're not thinking about digital equity in the context of the innovation it drives, right. we're going to ignore that some of the most vulnerable populations to climate change with some of the biggest incentives to innovate its solutions don't have the technology to do it. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. That, then, then we're not going to solve climate change. Right. So we need them all. And what I'm excited about is communities are now trying to figure out community-scale projects. So public mm. doesn't just mean government having utility. You know, if you're in Detroit and you have the Equitable Internet Initiative where community organizers are putting together gigabit service that residents are then going to be paid to install and know how to maintain, and then they're thinking about how that contributes to solving community problems, then you have an equation where you're experimenting with 21st century technology with people who are ignored and treated as if they're not able to innovate with technology, Mm -hmm. and actually giving them the tools to do some of that innovation. How does that change our lives? I mean, just like, you know, electricity, we all thought we'd have the power to turn on light bulbs, but that also opened up refrigeration and being able to stay up later at night. Like, what is this high-powered internet connectivity going to do to folks' lives that we can't do right now? What's so exciting about technology, if we if we harness it for good, because <laughs> the technology itself is neutral, right? right. We're right. the ones. It's how you use the we're technology, the ones who aren't how you regulate neutral. it, right? Mm-hmm. But if you think about Kansas City, when when Google Fiber went into Kansas City, mm-hmm. what they did not predict was the explosion of entrepreneurship mm-hmm. out of people's homes. It became such that, a hub for tech startups. Exactly. I mean, but the exciting thing about thinking about that vision and that future is we don't even know what good we could create. <laughs> you know, we can't even anticipate all the good we create. Looking into the future, what what is the recipe to get more access to more people at a lower cost? So we get to kind of the, the future that you're, that you're talking about. Regulation for the purpose of driving competition is critically important, right? But in addition, even if we had that, what we would want is to seed the kind of experimentation on other models of delivery, right? So this is my point about community-based projects that are hyper-local that communities are creating. Some of them are cooperative models. Some of them are not. Other public options, we have to give cities and towns and villages the ability to legally experiment. You know, we can't tie their hands. By giving them spectrum at a micro level? Is that how you do it? That's one way. Okay. Um, By telling them that they can negotiate more aggressively. There are ways in which, uh, you know, federal law ties the hands of local communities to experiment and to try to drive harder bargains. That has to be liberalized so that we get more experimentation. Uh, They won't all work. Right. But I don't think that's the goal. I think it's finding the secret sauce for different places and allowing the innovation to happen, just like the private sector gets to do. The public and nonprofit sector should get some space to experiment, fail, learn, and create new models that start to work for the country.
more from Jim and me as we talk about Maya's ideas for how to plug everyone into broadband after the break. So stay with us. So it feels abundantly clear that everybody needs the internet at home in order to function today. Yes. So the question is, how do we do that? How do we provide everybody with access that they can afford? Well, look, there is an option here, right? We could take broadband and we could say, you know what? We're going to make this into a utility service, right? That's what we do when something is a necessity. Mm -hmm. Like when Thomas Edison invented electricity, his first customer was J.P. Morgan, right? They were originally providing electricity to the wealthy. And the government stepped in and said, you know what? Like, actually, we need everyone to have access to electricity because it's that important. And that's what the utility model does. It requires companies to provide service to everybody. So if we believe that internet access is like a critical part of our economy and therefore everyone has to be online, then we should be thinking about a utility model because that is a decision we actually can make. Yeah, and as Maya pointed out, regulation doesn't have to be the enemy of competition, right? In this case, it actually might create more competition because the actual cables themselves, right, the pipes that provide us the Internet, they're essentially a monopoly. Right. Most cities only have one option. Exactly. But we could turn those pipes into a utility and then give other service providers access to them, creating more competition Mm -hmm. for the market. But... We're going to have to overcome the hostility of the big players in this space. You know, the Comcast, AT&T's, Verizon's. Yeah. They have demonstrated a real distaste for regulation through, like, the <laughs> net neutrality say, battles. To put it lightly. <laughs> well, listen, but what, are our, what are, are our other options here? I mean, using the ad-based model, I mean, that's not exactly that satisfying. It requires that we pay with our personal data. There's simply no free lunch here. There isn't. But, you know, we could allow cities and nonprofits to experiment with some new models that might actually work. Like Maya was saying, yeah. Yeah, but the problem is they keep getting shut down by their state capitals and the feds on these experimentations. So while they're getting shut down, we've got, you know, tech folks out here in Silicon Valley literally going over all of our heads. Elon Musk (laughs) just launched satellites into outer space to provide satellite internet. Low Earth orbit, yeah, satellites. Yeah, Amazon's doing something similar. Google's launched those Project Loon, the blimps that are, Mm -hmm. you know, providing internet in the developing world. Sure. But I mean, if those new experiments are going to solve the access problem, it's not only about the new tech, right? It's about the business model. Because yeah, yeah. what this comes down to what the role of government should be, right? To ensure mm-hmm. that everyone actually has the access. Otherwise, we're just going to repeat the same right problem we have now. Mm-hmm. But if we have a society, if we believe the internet is as important as water and electricity, then we've got to put our money where our mouth is, and we need to reimagine the current market model. We do, because otherwise, we're just creating this permanent digital underclass in our country, which has horrible consequences for society at large. And when you think about our little world of urban tech, it has huge consequences on that, right? Yes. If 25% of New York City alone is not online at home, you know, how many users are all of these urban tech startups missing out on. And it's not only that those who are getting left out don't get to participate fully in the digital economy. Yes. It's also that every new app, every new solution to an urban problem is being built on an algorithm without a complete data set. Right. It's missing like a quarter of the people. So the data is going to be skewed that they're basing these apps on. And not only that, we're missing out on all kinds of new tech solutions that they could be building, right? The new Ubers and Birds and Airbnbs, all of it. These folks who aren't online cannot be building the new, you know, unicorn. Right. You've got the social problem, and then you have an economic problem, which is those of us who have internet at home, we actually don't have like very good internet. And so we don't realize how much better it could be yeah. and how much more connected we could be compared, frankly, to other countries. Like, we, we're way behind, right? Yeah. Like, as Maya said, the International Telecommunications Union show that you know the US dropped to 22nd in terms of mm. internet penetration back in 2007 and we actually haven't made a lot of progress since. Yeah. That's an issue really like about global competitiveness and maybe USA today should write an article about <laughs> that as opposed to like, you know, broadband is not essential spending which clearly I think it's yeah, not. Yeah, so much for being non-essential. 
That's all for today. Until the next time we explore the wild world of urban tech, I'm Jim Capsis. And I'm Molly Turner. Technopolis is a production of City Lab. Nicole Flato is the City Lab editor and our favorite gigabit. Virginia Lore is our producer. Lizzie Jacobs is our executive producer. Josh Rogazin is our engineer. Our theme music is by Copilot. As a note of disclosure, Link NYC partnered with a company that eventually was bought by Sidewalk Labs, which I've advised in the past, but I did not work on Link NYC. And before you head off on your own summer vacation, we need your feedback to help us craft the future of the show. Take our very short survey to help tell us what you like and what you'd change. It's at citylab.com slash podcasts slash technopolis. And add us to your summer playlist so you can take us with you to the beach, pool, or whatever your destination. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts and wherever you like to listen. Molly and I will also be taking a summer break, so in the meantime, you can catch up on back episodes and read up on digital equity and other issues affecting our cities on citylab.com. Have a great summer.